Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone who has joined us this afternoon. So welcome to the webinar series on COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so this webinar series is jointly organized by Malaysian Society of Infection Control and Infectious Diseases or MyICID and Institute of, for Clinical Research NIH. I am Associate Professor Dr. Sharifah Farida Said Umar. I am an infectious disease physician at the University of Malaya Medical Center. Thank you very much for joining us live from five social media platforms. Before we begin, I would like to start with some information on how the session will run. So we will start off with two presentations from our esteemed speakers today, Dr. Riza and also Dr. Richard Lim. And we will then proceed to have a Q&A session. For the Q&A, like usual, please type your questions in the Slido app we would try to address as many questions as possible. Um, for your information, you can get CPD points for attending this session. All frontliners, healthcare professionals and allied health teams, remember to collect your CPD points by filling up the online attendance form. In case you missed it, we will broadcast again after the Q&A session. Please double check your email address before submitting. After the webinar, the presenter slide will be made available on all our social media websites and email newsletters. If you would like to re-watch this session, you can go to our clinical updates in, clin in COVID-19 YouTube channel or listen on our podcast channel when it is available. So this afternoon, we are indeed honored and privileged to have with us Dr. Riza Mazrin Razali, a geriatrician, and Dr. Richard Limboon Leong, a palliative care physician to share some insights on vaccinating the elderly with comorbid and those under palliative care. On behalf of the organizers, my ICID and Institute for Clinical Research NIH, I would like to thank both Dr. Riza and Dr. Richard for taking the time to join us this afternoon. So our first speaker, Dr. Riza Mazrin Razali, is the head of geriatric unit and internal medicine physician working in Kuala Lumpur Hospital. She's also an adjunct lecturer in the University Putrajaya, Malaysia, UPM, since 2014. Dr. Riza is also a visiting physician to Rumah Baitul Mawadda, Klang, Lembaga Zakat Selangor. And she also happens to be a good and old friend of mine, though I won't say how long we've known each other. So it gives me great pleasure to now invite Dr. Riza to share her presentation. Riza? Thank you, Shari. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Riza, I'm a physician and a geriatrician from Kuala Lumpur Hospital. So for the next 20 minutes, uh, we'll be talking about COVID-19 vaccination for the elderly. And after that, Dr. Richard will cover on the palliative aspects, including those with terminal stage of dementia. So this is my disclaimer. And uh, for the outline of my talk today, I'm going to start off by, you know, discussing the rationale of why we need to vaccinate the elderly. And then, of course, whether this vaccination is effective and whether it is safe to vaccinate them. And also, we need to touch upon a special um, aspect of the elderly who have been trailed and the issues in, with vaccinating them. And then moving on to the summary and the conclusion. So last year, 2020, the world was devastated by this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. And at this stage, it is clear that the persons most likely to develop severe illness and die from this virus are the elderly population, and especially those living in the nursing homes. When we say severe illness, it means that a person with COVID-19 who require hospitalization, intensive care, or a ventilator to help them breathe. So CDC, um, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, has reported that in US, eight, of, eight out of 10 COVID-19 deaths were reported in elderly uh, age 65 and above. And if you look at the uh, table below, below, you will see that those above 65 to 74 have about 1,300 risk, 1,300 times of risk of dying. 
And if you're 75 to 84, you have 3,200 times the risk of dying and 85 and above, you have about 87 times, 8,700 times risk of dying. And this is why CDC recommends that adults 65 and older are the first one groups to receive COVID-19 vaccines. And getting COVID-19 vaccine is the important step to help prevent getting sick from COVID-19. And that said, it might take time for before enough vaccines are made for everyone who wanted to be vaccinated. In October 2020, last year, there, when there were about more than 1 million documented deaths from COVID-19, Ionidis has come up with this paper and it shows that there were extremely strong risk stratifications across age, social, economic factors and clinical factors. And from this, fact, and from this paper, there were many early deaths that may have been due to suboptimal management or because we don't know much about the disease, malfunctional health systems in the nursing homes, uh, in the uh, health systems in the country itself, the use of hydroxychloroquine, nosocomial infections, as well as sending COVID-19 patients to nursing homes. Now, moving forward, we know that such tests are now partially avoidable. In this paper, he also provided estimations of infection case fatality rate uh, from institutionalized frail elderly, which creates about 25%. Others uh, above 75, 65 to 74 upper risk, um, but you know they're less than 65. And uh, the other high risk total, and if you total this up, this will amount up to about 33%. And based on this data, Brenner in recent publication in the Lancet Regional Health Europe, basing on the population statistics from Germany in 2019, this actually is the high risk group that made one third of the total population. And he found that without the vaccination, approximately 60% of the population would be expected to be infected in a full cycle of pandemic before the herd immunity is reached. And from this paper, he concluded that vaccination could have saved about 218,000 deaths, which is about 99% in those high risk group. And he found that just by vaccinating 95 people in those high risk group, you can prevent one COVID-19 death. But if you vaccinate, but you need to vaccinate 13,000 people in the low risk population to, present one, to prevent one COVID-19 death. So understanding this information and with the limitation of the number of uh, amount of vaccinations available, it is just logical to reserve these vaccines to those high risk people on a global scale and achieve that timely completion of vaccination campaigns so that we can prevent the vast majority of COVID-19 deaths before the herd immunity is achieved. Now, most of many of the elderly who died in the COVID-19 were actually from, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic last year, were actually from the long-term care facilities, so the nursing home uh, and the residents. And this is understandably because they are actually more advanced age. They are more uh, physically dependent. They have uh, cognitive issues, mental issues, and with other chronic health conditions. And of course, the movement of healthcare personnel among facilities in the region where they move from one place to another and they're likely going to spread the COVID infection. And being in a center, you are in a congregated space and thus the infection spreads even faster. So in this slide, you can see how high the percentage of deaths in long-term care facilities all around the globe. Therefore, the first phase of vaccination in many countries was actually focused on nursing home or long-term care facilities residents, which also means that they will be the first group of patients that will see the benefits and the potential side effects of the new vaccines. I mentioned just now about medical conditions that can increase risk of severe illness. Well, this is where the uh, data came from, um, you know, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cerebrovascular disease, dementia, malignancy. These are all the diseases that are very, very much synonyms to the older people. Now, after much discussion on the need to vaccinate the elderly, especially for those who live in the long-term care facilities, we might wonder whether, whether it is actually really effective. Well, 31,000 long-term care facilities have been in US have been affected uh, 
from COVID-19 by COVID-19 infection with more than 163,000 deaths. And um, the rollout vaccination began sometime mid-December last year, and it has shown a steep steep uh, decline in the number of new cases among the home uh, residents. And this is based on the New York Times analysis of the federal data. And if you look at the number of deaths among the nursing home residents since the vaccination rollout began uh, in mid-December, the number have reduced by 60%. And you might notice that in December, January, um, December last year and January this year, there was actually a spike of fatalities in overall uh, US uh, general populations uh, from COVID-19, but uh, the deaths among the nursing home residents continued to uh, decline. And uh, so far, the latest surveillance by CDC uh, to the nursing home uh, or the long-term care facilities there, the number of new cases up to March 28 seem to remain uh, low for the number of new cases as well as number of deaths. Now, I would think that it is actually quite safe to vaccinate the older people. I mean, um, sorry, we, we understand that there is a need to vaccinate the older people given the risk and the number of deaths being very, very high, but is it effective to vaccinate the elderly? Well, um, since there are a lot of vaccinations uh, that have been uh, done, uh, there were few vaccinations that have given that have been given to adults age um, 60 and above, namely the Pfizer BioNTech, Janssen, Moderna, AstraZeneca, um, but um, Sinovac, which is something that people have been talking about, has never actually uh, enrolled 60 and above in the trial. But uh, most of the studies in this uh, phase two or phase three studies actually showed uh, some good response, some efficacy of about uh, 70 to 90 percent, uh, including for the older people. And that uh, there are still more unpublished phase three analysis that soon to come out. So we are waiting for that to see uh, whether it is safe and also uh, effective to vaccinate them. Um, please take note that most of the trials and these trials of uh, these vaccinations do not actually include the elderly and the frail populations and that you don't have to be suspicious about it because most of uh, trials involving new drugs or new treatments will actually exclude the elderly and the frail ones. Uh, but um, fortunately for these uh, vaccines that have been tried out, uh, even though they excluded the elderly and the frail ones, it seems that the, the elderly and the frail ones are actually having much lesser side effects comparing to the younger population and the serious adverse effects are actually very, very rare. So um, most of us healthcare workers have actually been vaccinated. I had some pain on my arms for about three days, very mild pain, uh, but I actually had more of a headache, um, chills and uh, tiredness, which exactly lasted for 24 hours on its own. So it wasn't too scary and um, my second vaccination was rather uneventful. But um, what's more interesting or more convincing is that um, an article in New England Journal in February 25th, published in February 25th this year, a study by Israel looking into half, almost half a million of them, more than half a million, 592,000 population, uh, looking at the vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 outcomes during three time periods. And they look at documented infection, symptomatic illness, hospitalization, severe disease, and death. And of course, I would be interested to look at my elderly patient's outcome. Well, actually, they found that for all five uh, measures, there have been improvement or there have been decline in the infection uh, of COVID, symptomatic infection, hospitalization, severe illness or death. And um, what's more interesting is that this study shows that the vaccine efficacy uh, is actually similar to the reported in the randomized trial across all age group. And this effectiveness is high for the more serious outcomes, uh, which are the hospitalization, severe illness and death. And this estimated the benefit increases in magnitude as time passes. And this result strengthened the expectation that newly approved vaccines can help to mitigate the profound global effects of COVID-19 pandemics. Now, um, I'm going to talk about vaccinating the frail elderly here. Um, I need to highlight 
the concept of frailty. Um, and, and this concept of frailty is becoming even more relevant, highly relevant when we manage elderly, as we manage our elderly patients. When we talk about elderly, we must be aware that our elderly patients are really a heterogeneous group of adults. You won't find a similar 60-year-old or a 65-year-old or 80-year-old. You might find an 80-year-old or 85-year-old who's still very fit and actually able to walk or jog three kilometers a day. And on the other extreme, you might find those in their early 60s who are already bed bound from stroke or requiring dialysis from end stage renal failure. So what understanding, uh, so by understanding this frailty concept, it helps us in um, deciding which type of management is the best for the patient. And one of the best ways is using this tool called Clinical Frailty Score or CFS. And uh, it, has been, uh, it has been validated and has been shown to be useful for clinician to prognosticate and make decisions. So CFS is um, range from CFS one to nine, one being very fit and nine being terminally ill. And Dr. Richard will elaborate on CFS nine. CFS one to five, basically they are still very, well, rel relatively fit. Uh, CS CSF three to five, they are still able to go to the bank, um, you know, manage their laundry. They're still able to do their groceries. But CFS six and seven are usually those who are moderately frail and severely frail that actually need assistance because they are unable to do their basic activities of daily living without help. But the one that we may need to be a bit wary about is the CFS8, those who are living with a very severe frailty. And these are the group of patients who are frail enough that when um, you know, a minor illness, for example, like a simple non-complicated pneumonia happened, they actually run into complications one after another or they actually die from it. So this is the specific groups of frail elderly that we need to worry about. Uh, we need to be pay a bit more attention when we vaccinate them. For the rest of the CFS uh, score, I think that, you know, with whatever medical conditions, if there's no absolute contraindications to the general uh, uh, contraindications to vaccination, they should receive their vaccination regardless of their uh, whatever comorbidities that they have. So um, when we talk about frail elderly, you must also remember that, you know, remember I told you that some of them actually have uh, more dependency level and most of the time they are actually sent to nursing home because they are physically frail because of having some stroke or they have dementia and they cannot look after themselves. But this group of patients are also the ones that will have communication barrier. And they are also the type of patients that may not be able to complain to you from the side effects of the vaccination. They will just you know, present atypically um, maybe someone who's very rowdy and very loud in the nursing home that usually irritates the rest of the residents and the caregivers. But once they get vaccinated, they become very, very quiet. It is not the time for the caregivers to be happy about. You should be actually be wondering why he's actually quiet. Maybe he's actually having pain or discomfort and that he's unable to communicate. And, you know, look at their power put where they are or intake is good or poor, and make sure that they are well uh, hydrated. So this, um, especially the CFS 6, 7, 8, um, especially for 8, uh, we would suggest them requiring monitoring for at least 72 hours, where because we know that the side effects of vaccination usually um, last up to 24 to 48 hours. But having said that, um, most of the data worldwide showed that most of the elderly were rather asymptomatic, have no symptoms post-vaccination. Now, while we're talking about the frail, deep, uh, frail elderly, I know that um, most of us have actually been informed about the 23 deaths that occur in Norway after vaccination, and it has um, caused a bit of a panic and alarm um, for maybe the patients here, elderly patients who have actually registered for vaccination, their family members, and even us as healthcare workers, uh, we do have our concern. Uh, but there are a few things that you need to know um, from this report. Well, as of March 2021, uh, there have been about 360,000 people in Norway have been, have been vaccinated and mostly are elderly people in their nursing homes. And those who have been receiving this vaccination are actually very, very 
elderly, frail, with serious medical problem and probably terminally ill. And you also want to know that even before the vaccination rollout happened, it is normal to have about three to 400 nursing home residents died every week in Norway. That's a huge number. I'm learning that as well. So you can imagine that, you know, whether or not these 23 people, they're about to die, but when the vaccination is given, they coincidentally died right after the vaccination. But maybe even if the vaccination was not given, they actually already, you know, very, very ill already that they would have died anyway. And um, up to 5th of March last week, there have been about... 220 million doses of vaccinations have been administered throughout the world. And a um, majority of them were actually given to older people. And we have yet heard, apart from Norway, um, this um, adverse effects of uh, vaccinations for the elderly. And that um, Norway actually followed exactly um, UK um, rollout uh, SOP using the same vaccination. And uh, so far, UK have not sent out any alarming um, minder or notes uh, to CDC uh, about the potential the harm of, uh, of um, uh, vaccinating the older people. And um, from these uh, reports, what they have done is actually they have actually looked into the severely frail patients for vaccination. And again, they have actually looked at the severest end of the clinical fatal scale, which I mentioned just now. And they are being uh, more cautious with those with CFS 8 and 9 uh, assessment and evaluating before they actually um, give out the vaccination. So, um, Based on all this, you know, we have actually discussed uh, on how best way that we can actually make sure that elderly get vaccination and at the same time, there is um, some security that they will be fine. So based on the data that we have, we feel that for those who are clinical critical score one to five, vaccination is really encouraged and pre-vaccination assessment is really not required. Uh, for those who moderately to severely frail, CFS six to seven, vaccination is still highly encouraged. It's just that for clinicians who are reviewing the patient at the hospital or the PPP, you know, they must know that the patient is in a stable condition, that there is no ongoing medical problems such as acute or recurrent or persistent infections or complications uh, going on. Okay, when uh, you expect there's the det deterioration uh, to happen. But for those who are very severely frail, clinical frailty score eight, we are not going to say that this patient by default should not receive, should be denied vaccination. We should still encourage them to be vaccinated, but the clinical assessment should look for active signs of dying, include you know, any declining vital signs and clinical conditions in the face of medical complications, which are not reversible. So for example, if the patient already have end stage renal uh, disease, but the patient has been deemed not for dialysis, and you know, giving vaccination may cause them to tilt them into poor oral intake, unwell, dehydration, and result in an acute kidney injury that may result in complications. Um, and they are not for dialysis, so we may not want to defer. We may want to defer them, uh, this group of patients, because then we know that the vaccination may cause more harm than benefit. But as far as I can see uh, from my um, usual daily practice, clinical frailty score eight is not as many as you know, those clinical frailty score one to six or seven. So in summary, older people who get COVID-19 infection are much more likely to get severe illness due to multiple chronic medical illnesses. The frail elderly with COVID-19 infection are most likely to die compared to those who are not frail. The residents of the long-term care facilities are more likely to get and die from COVID-19 infections. So uh, vaccinations should be focused on them. First, COVID-19 vaccines are safe for elderly, but more data on efficacy is needed. But as for now, we'll be happy to know that benefits far outweigh the risk. And very severely frail elderly needs clinical assessment before vaccine is administered. So in conclusion, COVID-19 vaccines are safe for elderly and therefore they should be vaccinated. And very severely frail, frail elderly needs clinical assessment before vaccine is administered. That's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Riza.
Um, you know, as we move into phase two of vaccination in the country, um, thank you so much for that presentation. It has shed some light on the impact of COVID on elderly, the benefit for vaccination in this population. And also you've given us some tips on what are the precautions or the sign or the things that we should be looking up before we vaccinate them. Okay, so if you have any questions to ask Dr. Riza, please type your questions in the Slido. Uh, we will only start answering questions after Dr. Richard's presentation. So our second speaker for today is Dr. Richard Lim Bun Leong, who is a consultant palliative medicine specialist or physician and head of palliative care unit at Slayang Hospital. He is the national advisor in palliative medicine for Ministry of Health and the chairman for subspecialty fellowship training committee in palliative medicine. So Dr. Richard is a senior lecturer and examiner for advanced diploma in palliative care, nursing curriculum, Ministry of Health. So without further ado, I now invite Dr. Richard to share his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharifa. Um, okay, and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm gonna now continue to talk about the COVID vaccination uh, in patients requiring palliative care. Um, and this is just my disclaimer slide. But what I'd like to talk about would be first and foremost, the need for COVID vaccination, even in the terminally ill, um, and then recommendations for the vaccination in this group of patients requiring palliative care. Uh, and then a bit about the prognostication of common chronic conditions uh, requiring palliative care and some of the additional benefits that we can hope to achieve uh, from vaccination in this group. So when we talk about palliative care, I think that many of you are familiar with the term. Uh, we know that it's, you know, this, uh, um, discipline which talks about quality of life, pain relief, comfort, and helping patients with incurable uh, conditions uh, and also life-limiting conditions to kind of uh, live out the rest of their lives with some degree of quality and comfort. But then, of course, there are some negative perceptions also to palliative care, uh, where people tend to think about it in terms of death, dying, suffering, end of life, and hopelessness. And so when you talk about vaccinating the terminally ill, I mean, definitely there are some who may have questions like, you know, that what's the point of vaccinating uh, the, as these patients won't benefit from it? Um, and maybe like it's a waste of the vaccine because these patients are still going to pass on. Uh, and maybe we should actually allow healthier patients to benefit more from the vaccines. And then, of course, maybe there are some concerns about how the vaccine might make these the group of patients pass on faster than they should. Um, so just now, uh, Dr. Riza has explained already the clinical frailty scale. And what I'm gonna look at actually is focusing on CFS nine, which is the terminally ill. But when you look at the clinical frailty scale from one to eight, it does seem like you know, there is actually uh, a progression of you know, from CFS one to eight, patients are more and more unwell and frail. But when you reach CFS nine, actually the definition for this group is actually those who are approaching the end of life and uh, where the life expectancy is less than six months, but they may not otherwise be evidently frail. So um, we, we need to understand that perhaps they are in this category, mainly because they do have uh, a, uh, an incurable condition whereby their survival may be less than six months, but they may not actually be so frail. And they may actually have quite a, a, a few months left of good quality life to actually live out. And so when you ask the question like, you know, what is the benefit that these patients actually can derive if they've only got a few months left? So just to highlight an issue that came about in the United Kingdom uh, a few months ago in December, um, this was an appeal by you know, uh, uh, a, a patient, a 38 year old um, a gentleman who was a father of two, who actually has, is kind of battling stage four bowel cancer and has no more options for treatment. And he's actually made a, he lobbied to the uh, British Parliament to actually um, relook and, and consider, you know, the terminally ill uh, to prioritize uh, vaccinations for this group of patients. And um, what he felt was that, you know, even though patients may be terminally ill, but there's still time that they have that they want to utilize, you know, with some degree of quality, and they don't want to actually spend all of that time sheltered or shielded in their homes or in a room. Uh, they would like to spend the last months of their life actually being able to do some of the things that they would like to fulfill before the end of their life. And so I think that there's been a lot of support for this appeal. And I think uh, in the end, the British uh, Parliament has actually uh, considered to actually re, uh, re look at you know, their 
um, prioritization rollout for the terminally ill and their COVID vaccination rollout. So in Malaysia, um, in terms of the scope of palliative care, this is some data from my unit here in Salayang Hospital last year. Um, you can see that about two thirds of our patients are actually those with advanced cancer, but there is at least one third of our patients who are actually those without uh, cancer, but also have kind of incurable conditions and may be considered terminally ill. Those are patients with uh, end-stage renal disease and CKD5, uh, those with stroke, cardiac failure, uh, liver disease, uh, chronic lung disease, neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and if you look at our priority groups that we put in our guideline, actually, we do actually prioritize those who are immunocompromised from diseases, uh, particularly those with uh, malignancies and also those with chronic illnesses like chronic heart, kidney, liver, uh, neurological, and respiratory diseases, and those with diabetes and complications of diabetes. And so if you look at the uh, phase three data from uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, trial, you can actually see that about 20% of the patient population actually uh, had comorbidities. And these comorbidities did include those with malignancies, about 4% of them have malignancies. Uh, they also had those with pulmonary disease and congestive cardiac failure, um, and also those with uh, renal disease and uh, complications of uh, chronic complications of diabetes. And these are the kind of conditions that you know, we also do see uh, in palliative care and those requiring uh, you know, um, that, that care towards the end of their lives. Um, and so from this data, maybe we can extrapolate that first in these group of patients, uh, the, there is efficacy from the vaccine. And at the same time, uh, in the study, actually, there weren't that many uh, serious uh, adverse events. And so it is actually fairly safe. So as a general recommendation that we are putting up for patients requiring palliative care and the terminally ill, what we say is that the COVID-19 vaccination is still recommended for all patients with incurable chronic illness, where the prognosis is estimated to be more than three months. And so we would really only exclude those patients who are truly actively dying or those who have a terminal illness with an estimated prognosis of less than one month. And so that seems quite straightforward, I suppose. But I guess the, the real question is then, how do we determine if a patient has a prognosis of one month or less? And do we have a crystal ball that will tell us no? So I guess we have to apply some of the evidence and what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about how we can prognosticate a bit to have a better understanding about where patients may be going and which patients may benefit or may not benefit from vaccination. So when we talk about prognostication, um, this is uh, commonly when in palliative care, we, we talk about illness trajectories when we want to think about how patients will actually uh, progress in their illness. And these are the three typical illness trajectories that we see in patients typically requiring palliative care. So the first line, which you see here in black, is actually that of uh, the trajectory of metastatic cancer or patients with CKD5 uh, who are not undergoing renal replacement therapy. And so uh, what you see is that for quite a long time, it could be months, uh, if not perhaps even uh, a year or more, that they actually remain quite stable. And then there is this period where they have a, a decline, sharp decline in their condition, and that's when they uh, start deteriorating over a period of months. Now, the red line is that of end organ failures like cardiac, chronic lung disease, or liver disease. And these patients actually typically uh, uh, have a steady decline over a period of months and years, but interspersed with intermittent exacerbations where they get admitted, but they can actually recover to some degree, but never to their baseline. Finally, they reach one point where they have an exacerbation where they actually uh, don't recover and then they pass on. Now, the blue line is what we call prolonged dwindling. And this is the trajectory that you see in patients with uh, things like uh, severe dementia, uh, stroke, frailty. And uh, these patients are never very well because they're all very frail, but they go on for many, many months and if not years. So as I said, the key here is that how do we actually determine when patients reach this part of the trajectory, which is less than one month of survival. For those who are in the black uh, trajectory, black line trajectory, uh, this is the most predictable group. Um, the red line trajectory or organ failure, this is the least predictable. And I guess for the blue line, while we do have some tools to assess, but it's not very accurate. So I'll go through some of these, uh, the common things, like first and foremost, 
advanced cancer and how do we prognosticate? So for advanced cancer patients, it's known that uh, one of the, uh, the main factor that determines the um, prognosis would be the performance status of the patient. So uh, we use two typical scales, which we have uh, the Karnofsky and the ECOG performance scale. This is the Karnofsky scale or the KPS, which is a hundred point scale uh, with intervals of 10 and hundred means you're perfectly normal and 60 when you're 60, uh, it means that you can care for yourself, but you're unable to carry on with your normal activities. And by 50, you are actually requiring a lot of assistance and at 40 and below you are bed bound. Now ECOG, uh, you have zero to four at zero, you're perfectly normal. Uh, at three, you're having some limited self-care, but you're confined to a bed or a chair more than 50% of waking hours. And then by ECOG 4, you're actually bed bound. So in studies that actually look at the median survival of patients, uh, correlating that with the uh, performance status, you can see that patients who have a Karnofsky score of 50 or more and or ECOG 3, they still have actually a median survival of about two to three months. But when their Karnofsky score is 40 and below or ECOG 4, this is when the survival is probably around the range of weeks to short months, one to two months. And so we would say that any patient with advanced cancer and a performance status of worse than KPS 50 or ECOG 4 may not, ben may not benefit from vaccination because their survival may not actually allow them to benefit from it. Now, moving on to... Uh, CKD5 and NSH renal disease where they are not planned to have renal replacement therapy. Um, again, similar to cancer, they've got quite a steady kind of uh, condition for many months and sometimes even uh, a year or more. Uh, and then they develop a sharp decline in their function uh, and they have increasing symptoms of distress. And so uh, at this point, we know that when they develop this point, the prognosis is normally around two months before they actually pass on. And so for CKD5 patients who are deteriorating with a KPS of 60 or below, and you see that they're having increasing symptoms of dyspnea, fatigue, pruritus, agitation, drowsiness, pain, these patients also may not benefit so much from vaccination because their prognosis may be a bit short. Now, for the next group where I said it's quite unpredictable, especially in cardiac failure, this is a highly unpredictable group because uh, in the last six to 12 months of these patients' lives, um, a lot of the time they, they actually uh, may have sudden death. And also um, they may have, and also because, um, you know, in, in uh, cardiology, there are all kinds of increasing uh, evolving standards of heart fa failure therapies. And so um, uh, these patients where they may have had no options before, suddenly they actually have some treatment options. So it's a bit hard to predict. But if you look at the one-year mortality and the NYHA class, um, those with NYHA class four, uh, the one-year mortality is roughly about 30 to 40%. Um, and if uh, uh, the, those with NYHA class four have independent factors such as uh, recent cardiac hospitalization, poor ejection fraction, anemia, um, cardiac cachexia, reduced performance status, um, renal impairment, uh, ventricular dysrhythmias, uh, low blood pressure, tachycardia, and comorbidities, then you know that their prognosis would be worse than this, but it's still a one-year mortality, and, and that's as much as you can say. So probably uh, in patients with severe cardiac failure with NYHA class four and having multiple poor prognostic factors, they still could actually benefit from vaccination. The pros and cons must be discussed, uh, but because we know that you know, it's very unpredictable and they may still have a prognosis of uh, some months to even a year. Now for COPD patients, uh, we have a tool called the BODE or BODE index, which is a composite index of uh, the body mass index, the dyspnea scale, the uh, effort tolerance and the FEV1. And if you look at the worst uh, body index score that you can get, it still corresponds to a one-year mortality of only 5%. So many of these patients, even with poor body scores, they are actually uh, still having prognosis of more than you know, six months to a year. Um, and very often we, we use the body index for patients who are maybe still uh, uh, having outpatient care. So anyone who can come to the clinic and well enough to come to the clinic, uh, are still it's probably still worthwhile to have them vaccinated. But when you come to COPD patients who are hospitalized, then if they have a high CO2 or require mechanical ventilation, then we know that actually their prognosis becomes much poorer. And, and many of these patients actually will pass on within one year. Um, so for COPD patients who are seen as in outpatient settings, um, they should actually still be vaccinated. 
and hospitalized patients with a history of mechanical ventilation and raised CO2, they still can be considered for vaccination because um, it's still, they still could actually have many months, uh, although a lot of these patients may pass on within the year. Now for chronic liver disease, I think many people are familiar with the Charles Pew score, which is something which is kind of easy to calculate um, and you can classify them in class A, B, and C. But even for those with class C, actually the one year survival is still 45%. So these patients actually still can survive for quite some time. Um, and it's not so discriminatory. So in recent years, I think uh, hepatologists and gastroenterologists have preferred to use the MEL score or the model for end-stage liver disease. And this is actually a score which uh, is a bit complicated to calculate it, but you can use a calculator uh, just keying in the uh, total bilirubin, the uh, serum creatinine and the INR, and this will give you a score. And what we know is that uh, for patients with MEL scores of more than 30, their three month mortality is over 50% and it gets worse as the MEL score goes up. And so those chronic liver disease patients who have MEL scores of over 30, uh, maybe they may not benefit so much from vaccination as well, because they may actually have uh, a kind of a poor prognosis uh, in the range of maybe one to two months. Now, lastly, for dementia patients in that last line that I said, it's sometimes not so accurate. Uh, what we have is something known as the uh, functional assessment staging, where we can stage patients with um, uh, dementia. And stage seven is actually when you have severe dementia. And that's when the patients can hardly talk and they can hardly walk. Um, and if what we know is that if they have stage seven, severe dementia with any of these, one or more of these co, uh, dementia-related comorbidities, like aspiration, UTI, sepsis, multiple uh, pressure sores, or weight loss, their median survival is somewhere in the range of maybe about six, seven months, uh, still less than a year, but probably still some months. And so what would say for dementia patients, even those with severe dementia, fast stage seven, um, they, they should still be vaccinated unless they're having ongoing and persistent medical complications. Right, as mentioned just now by Dr. Riza. And this is actually the fast uh, staging scale uh, where stage seven is severe dementia. They can only speak a few words. They can hardly do anything physically. Now, having said all of that, I guess um, it's not an exact science, but this is what we can say, you know, in terms of prognostication. And so you may have patients where you can clearly see that they may not actually benefit, but then there are those who, you're, you know, you're a bit wondering, you're not sure, and you're kind of worried. I think that whatever it is, in fact, the message that we get from you know, what's happened in Norway is that um, still, when we're not too clear about it, but we have some idea, the, the basic principle is still that of autonomy and informed consent. And so we should always you know, go through the pros and cons with our patients and explain to their families as well. And when we explain things to the families and the patients about the benefits of the vaccination in, in this particular group of uh, patients requiring palliative care, I think that we need to note that there are some additional benefits beyond the fact that, you know, uh, we, the typical benefits of uh, preventing severe COVID-19 uh, infections, um, we can actually say that some of the other benefits that you may reap from vaccination may be first to enable easier access to care. And I think that what we've seen throughout the pandemic is that many patients who are unwell, they actually are frightened or they're afraid to come to hospitals because they're afraid of actually getting COVID infections uh, from patients around there. And so then what they do is they avoid coming to the hospital and they, they hold on to their symptoms until it's very late. So with their if they're vaccinated, perhaps this reduces that, that concern and that burden and it may enable easier access to care. It also may help to reduce the need for isolation, uh, allow family and friends to spend more time together, and it allows more freedom to spend the last months of their life with better quality. So um, for those who uh, you feel that you know, you, they cannot be vaccinated or they need to be excluded, or they choose not to be vaccinated, um, what's also very important for all of us as healthcare providers is to uh, ensure that if we can't vaccinate someone, we should ask the family and the carers of this person to make sure that they are vaccinated. And we should also try and discourage you know, those who have not been vaccinated to visit patients who cannot be vaccinated for some particular reason, right? So um, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, please uh, do not discriminate or marginalize patients who are actually in this category where they have terminal illness, but they may still have some months of good life ahead they can actually benefit from the vaccination. And I hope that, you know, uh, they, that we would still recommend and encourage this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard, for excellent presentation. 
um, I mean, it's a good insight on how vaccination may still be very useful and needed in palliative patients, a group of patients which is often forgotten when we talk about, you know, treatment which involves long-term benefits, you know, uh, vaccination being one of them preventing COVID-19. So often people think that palliative patients or patients with chronic illnesses and stage uh, organ disease uh, may not benefit from that. And also I, I find it very interesting the guide given on, uh, you know, how to prognosticate patients and how to choose those who may benefit vaccination. So weighing up the the pros and cons of the benefits of vaccination against the harm done to the patient. Okay, so with that, we'll spend the next 15 to 20 minutes on questions that has been posted through on the Slido uh, app. Um, and uh, we will try to answer as many clinical questions as possible. We will not be addressing any policy related questions as it is beyond our scope of clinical practice. Um, I would also like to focus on questions related to the webinar today, which is vaccination in the elderly and also those with uh, uh, palliative care patients, all right? So let's start with the first question. Um, I'm going to start with the one on the top there, which is, um, maybe this is for Dr. Riza. Is there any truth that those above 60 years old um, are not advisable to be given Sinovac? vaccine from, vac from China? Because I think there's a lot of news of Sinovac coming into phase two, phase three. Uh, so we do need to know a little bit more about um, you know, Sinovac and those above 60 years old. Yeah, um, I think um, this Sinovac vaccine seemed to be um, something that people are talking about, including my own colleagues. Um, what published data have shown us so far is that um, they have not, the, the phase two trial have not included those um, above 60 years old. But to answer that question, is there any truth that those above 60 years old are not advisable? I would say that I couldn't find um, any information saying that that is uh, not, that is not advisable, no. Uh, it's just that there is no information, published information yet. So um, we still have time. So I think it's very important for us to wait first. But no, there is no truth saying that 60 years old are not advisable to be given Sinovac vaccine from China. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I think we need to differentiate between contraindication and who should get it, right? So far, we haven't seen any real contraindication um, no. and there's not much data in those who are above 60 though I think our secretariat uh, sort of popped up some 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 yeah. news hot off the press saying that there are some places where um, it may be given to above 60 but we'll wait for that to come out um, uh, in, in the literature but announcing it, yeah. Thank you. yeah okay so I think there's another one for you, Riza. Um, is there any particular COVID-19 vaccine deemed not safe for the elderly? If so, how will they know if they are receiving the right type of vaccine? Okay, so again, um, from, my, from my research, I have not find any vaccine that is deemed not safe. But you have to understand that some of the vaccines, they are not given, be, not because they are not safe, because they have no data. So having no data is not equivalent to not being safe for the elderly. So, um, it, so the question is, how will we know if the, our elderly patients are receiving the right type of vaccine? Well, like I said, this is based on a lot of information, a lot of statistics and data, and is uh, actually a very, very uh, clear and, you know, on, in terms of the safety of the vaccines. So definitely when the vaccines are being delivered to the population, to any group of uh, patients, um, there is some information about the safety of the vaccination of the type of the vaccines that are going to be given uh, to which type of patients to which group of patients you know and and how the vaccines are going to be delivered all those things matters so before the decision is made on uh, whether the, the 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 vaccine is suitable for the patient of course you know the the information and discussion among experts have already been done. So I think uh, for public, of course, 
um, I would be concerned too if I'm not being the healthcare um, fraternity, not knowing you know extra information. But I think that anyone who is going to receive the vaccination, any form of treatment, it has been um, screened through. Uh, you know, very detailed information has of the right vaccination uh, type before it is uh, being delivered to the public. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one, one of the things that a lot of people are probably concerned about is because with the phase two and phase three, uh, you know, what we hear is you can't really choose your vaccines, but we, we're really waiting for more information. I think it depends on a lot of factors as, as what Riza has said, the suitability of the candidate and also uh, which vaccine would be suitable for which type of, not just patient, but um, you know, where the vaccine is going and, and so on. So, so I'm sure whatever vaccine that we do roll out or give to a particular person, we would make sure that they are suitable for that uh, particular vaccine. Okay. Um, I would like to give one to uh, Richard, please. Um, it's on somebody with a comorbids, patient with hypertension, diabetes and stroke on multiple medication. One of the side effects is patients may develop palpitations after vaccination. Um, I, I think there was also another question about somebody who had bradycardia. Uh, can they receive these vaccines? Right, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that certainly if they've got hypertension, diabetes and stroke, in fact, uh, this, this kind of patient uh, has been actually shown uh, from some of the, the, the data how, um, you know, they, 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 if they did develop a COVID infection, definitely they would have uh, um, a more severe kind of uh, risk. And, and so definitely these patients actually should actually be vaccinated. Um, and although you can get a, a, you know, some palpitations maybe, uh, the, these side effects actually are, are, are quite, are, are not very dangerous, right? And, and so it's definitely I would say that yes, you can receive the vaccine in this situation. Yeah, okay, okay. that's good. Um, I think there's another one for you. Uh, can't find it now. <laughs> um, somebody with... with... Cancer, I think. Was it someone with cancer? Yeah, is COVID-19 vaccination safe for cancer survivors who are in their 80s? So it's a, it's a combination of the two topics, isn't it? Um, right. Of uh, somebody with the cancer, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they're also in their 80s. <laughs> yes. So, so I think that definitely uh, someone being in their 80s, again, uh, being at uh, risk of, uh, you know, a very severe COVID infection, vaccination is very important for people in their 80s. So, uh, and if you're a cancer survivor, I think if you're, if you're in remission, uh, you know, and, and you've been kind of cured or, or the cancer is actually under control, there is no reason why you, you know, cannot actually have the vaccine. Uh, and also, if say you had, I mean, you may be a cancer survivor, but you do actually have maybe uh, the, the cancer is still present, but not so active, uh, and you're still quite well, uh, and um, you're still enjoying, your, you know, uh, whatever it is that you would like to do, definitely, yes, I would recommend to be vaccinated in, in this situation. Yeah, yeah. I think the survival scores that you had put forward and also the frailty score, um, it does help to, to give us some insight on who should who would benefit from it, right? In these difficult situations. Okay. Um, a question for Riza. Um, I, I think we probably need to... Okay, sorry. Is there a different approach to vaccinate elderly for those with same... Uh, clinical frailty score, home dwelling versus nursing home residents. So I think this is more like, you know, um, if somebody had the same clinical frailty score, would which one would be more of a priority, the home dwelling or the nursing home residents? I think that's what they're trying to ask here. Okay. I was trying to figure out what that, you know, <laughs> we can go many ways from that question. But if, um, if from my understanding from your question, whether who gets to be, who should be vaccinated first, then um, I would have to say that it has to be the nursing home residents first, because um, the nursing home residents are those who have higher risk of, you know, getting, uh, of, of spreading the uh, the infections uh, throughout the home and you know each home there are easily about 20 to 30 residents and um, definitely if we can't prevent an outbreak we should 
um, do that first. Yeah. So uh, I would go for the nursing home residence first. Um, and then we go to the website. Sometimes you have to prioritize based on the, the supply that we have, right? Um, okay, uh, the next one again for you, Riza, because I think this is quite an interesting question and a practical one as well. Hi, doctor. What are the things that elderly must know and be ready regarding preparation before taking the injection for COVID vaccine? So some advice, you know, we will be bringing our, our parents in, the elderly population, just some practical advice, I suppose, for the public on what needs to be prepared before they take the injection. Okay, this is a very good question. I'm happy that someone is asking this, meaning that they are ready to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, um, you just need to continue your medications if you're on any, as usual. You know, take your antihypertensives, your uh, oral antidiabetic drugs, as usual. Um, but um, I would think that, you know, have enough rest, be very relaxed, and try and to think positive, you know, rather than having all the negative thoughts in your mind. Um, I think mental preparation is quite important, a very good rest. And also um, my own experience uh, getting vaccinated, um, even though we are healthcare workers, getting vaccination in our, our own hospital, um, you have to wait for a while. You know, it takes about one to a one and a half hour to complete the process um, because there will be people waiting. So, uh, you know, make sure that you're wearing the right clothes. You're not rushing. Um, you, you take your, you know, you, you, you are very well uh, mentally prepared that there will be some time waiting there, bring your magazine, uh, you know, bring your handphone, uh, do stuff that will not make you uh, think too much about the, you know, what have been said, rumored about uh, vaccination. Um, and then uh, I would say that um, take enough water and uh, although there are some people who advocated to take a prophylaxis paracetamol before the vaccination, apparently uh, it was not actually advised by CDC. But um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, make sure that you do have your Panadol post uh, uh, vaccination if you do have pain over the injection site or if you feel the taji, don't be too scared to take your um, Panadol there. And also, I think that. Um, just have the confidence that, you know, everything will actually be um, okay. Uh, I think it's very important to, to, to have a very positive mind uh, going through all this process. Yeah. yeah. And just don't open your WhatsApp for 24 hours before because you hear all these. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. We might need to exit yourself from certain WhatsApp group. <laughs> Exactly. Um, Richard, um, well, one question here. I'm not sure whether you can try and answer it. Can the tools described by Dr. Richard be used in the non-frill population? Oh, um, not sure which tools, right. Like, uh, you mean like the, uh, the Karnofsky score and the, eco I mean, those tools certainly, um, yes, we, we do use it. I mean, we use it in a way to communicate also uh, to other colleagues and um, to document actually what is the condition of a patient. So definitely the performance scales can be used. Um, if you have patients who have liver disease and, uh, and, and you want to actually use the MELS score to actually assess them, um, yeah, all of these tools definitely can be used for any of these patients in whichever condition they are. I mean, it's more disease specific. Like, actually, these tools are more disease specific. Uh, the Konofsky and the ECOG, however, is, is, uh, can be used across the board. And it's really just a tool to help us understand a little bit more about where this patient is headed. And those trajectory scores, uh, trajectory uh, illness trajectories are actually things that uh, you should be able, hopefully for clinicians to keep in your mind. Like, you know, when you see a patient, um, someone who actually has cancer may not actually be the same as someone who has dementia, may not be the same as someone who actually has a heart failure. So, so at least you can keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. Again, tools are tools, you know, guidelines are guidelines, scoring are scorings, right? At the end of the day, it's just a guide. Uh, and we should not be too rigid and, and you know, just... Oh, oh, yes, certainly. Certainly, it is actually just a guide, yeah, and it will give you some idea, but it will, it is by no means uh, absolute and it's not entirely accurate, 
but at least it gives us some idea of how we would actually proceed and how we would actually have discussions and conversations with patients and families you know, about what's going on and what we can anticipate. Yeah, exactly. Um, another one for you. Um, the, the question is quite short, but maybe you can sort of interpret it and answer accordingly. Elderly with critical illness, is she, does she need to take vaccination? Right. Okay, yes, it's a little bit vague. Uh, I mean, it uh, depends on what critical illness. But I think that in general, uh, what we are recommending is that uh, for the elderly, um, I think regardless of the age, and for anyone with an illness, uh, a comorbidity, um, you know, regardless of the comorbidity, actually, we would want everyone, we would recommend the vaccination for everyone. Um, the only time, as I said, that we would, may actually exclude someone from uh, you know, being vaccinated would be those who are very unwell and actively, we think that they're actively dying. And so we think that their prognosis or their survival will be actually very short, uh, a matter of weeks to maybe one month or less. And because uh, for them to actually benefit from the vaccination, I guess you need to actually have a certain duration uh, after the vaccination. Um, I mean, yes, uh, last week, I think Dr. Benedict told, told us about how, uh, you know, if you have one vaccination, the first dose, and then three weeks later, you have another dose, uh, you, you will only get the full benefit of the vaccination of two weeks after your second dose. So it takes about five weeks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, there's some, some questions on, uh, again, I've lost it again. So I think trying to convince the elderly to, to vaccinate, because as we mentioned previously, we've seen so many things in, in WhatsApp. So one talks about how to convince the elderly who believe in Suna food or, you know, all these alternative medicine kind of food. And also with so many scary news social media how do we convince elderly that vaccine is safe for them any again any tips uh from the both of you probably Riza first uh, well i um i think the the our our um health and you know, not health minister the religious minister uh, has already come out with the fatwa and a, a very um detailed explanation on how it you know, important the vaccine is. So I think um, read through that first. Um, many of times, um, I don't think, I think that, you know, a lot of, um, I would say, our population, Muslims, don't really, really understand the drops of the concepts of, um, you know, relying or putting your trust to the expert. And the expert here does not necessarily mean a religious scholar. It also means an expert in that field, you know. So in this case, it's a doctor, right, who has the knowledge and has the information about this. So that is the expert that you that I think that you need to listen to. And if they want to try all this pomakanan sunnah, by all means, if there is no, you know nothing that can actually worsen their health condition, but why not combine it with the modern uh, treatment as well? And I don't see any contraindications in this uh, vaccination. It's being a, a modern treatment, and it's just that I I also think that you know all this um, traditional kind of uh, treatment. Um, Makanan, uh, this health supplement, there probably no real data to show that they can also have adverse effects if they are not taken in, you know, the right amount, if they're taken in excessive amount. Yeah, so um, I think it's very important to really speak to the religious scholar who understand, who, who can really follow the, the fatwa uh, that has been, um, you know, given up uh, on this matter. Or maybe just get uh, another patient, uh, maybe neighbors or aunts, uh, you know, who already got vaccinated and say, look, I'm all right. <laughs> so, you know, you should try it too. They probably will listen to those who have that, that already had that experience and knowing that it's actually fine, that will convince them that it'll, they'll be fine as well. I don't know. What do you have to say, Dr. Richard? Oh, well, I mean, I, I think that maybe I, I, I won't know much about the, the, the religious perspective, but what I would say is that um, at the end of the day, um, you know, everyone actually does have a right to make the decision on their own. What's most important is that we give them adequate 
and uh, accurate information. So I think that um, giving them you know, proper information about the benefits of the vaccination and the reason why they need to take the vaccination, uh, the reasons why they, they, they can, uh, we are recommending the vaccination is important. So apart from protecting themselves, um, it, it's also about protecting others. And also, um, as I mentioned, for those who are very unwell, it may actually help you in some other ways by allowing you to be a little bit more um, free uh, to do some of the things that you want to do. So I think that, um, you know, if we can tell them about the benefits, uh, at the end of the day, they, they still have the right to their autonomy. So um, yeah, maybe if we're not able to convince them, but um, be, be honest, right? And, and also, uh, I guess, the other thing is maybe on a on a note of you know trying to communicate with someone, um, we always should should ensure that we build adequate rapport with the person. You know, we, we shouldn't get angry at them if they express a differing view from ours, uh, so that at least we can and we we should actually uh, listen to their fears. I think that sometimes people are fearful and then they like to hear things which will convince them that they are doing the right thing by not taking the vaccine. So perhaps we listen to their fears and we empathize with the fact that yes, I know you're frightened. And then we try to explain it to them. And, and if we can build better rapport that way, hopefully we can convince them in a better way. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot. Great tips, guys. Um, I think well, there's one interesting question for Riza. For those in CFS score three who are consuming heart medications, such as Plavix, uh, BP and diabetic tablets, is it advisable to do a pre-vaccination consultation? So that's quite interesting, isn't it? This pre-vaccination consultation, which has been uh, advocated for phase two. Yeah, so um, I think um, just looking at these statements, FS3 and uh, with all those medications, I think they can actually skip the pre-vaccination consultation. But um, personally, if um, they want any of the patients in this condition actually wanted a pre-vaccination consultation, I would actually allow and, and encourage because um, we need to like, you know, like what Dr. Richard has just mentioned, I guess we need to be very clear what are the things that, you know, um, that make them feel um, that they need the consultation, that they need the, to be cleared about before the vaccination is given. Um, but uh, in general, I would say that um, most of the medications um, safe. Most of these medications for the chronic illnesses are safe, but there will be some sort of screening done before the vaccination is given to check on the patient's uh, uh, type of um, uh, medications that they are taking and where they will be vaccinated also matters. Uh, some will be vaccinated in hospital depending on their risk. And um, I think the majority will actually be uh, vaccinated in the community at the uh, PPVs that has been allocated to them. So um, for this question, if there is um, if there is other reason that they wanted to seek for uh, pre-vax consultation for elderly, uh, yes, I, I'm always open to to have um, you know consultation done and to be very clear about what are the things that actually worries them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's two things. Is one is to make sure that they are safe for the vaccination or they're suitable for the vaccination, and also to alleviate uh, any fears that they might have or any questions that they might have. So yeah, um, but obviously we can't pre-vaccinate consult everyone. Otherwise, we'll never get it going, right? So Correct. yeah, it's a good thing. Um, there's a lot of questions on Sinovac and more than sixty and whatnot. I think I don't think you know, we can answer that question here because I think that the main thing is currently uh, Sinovac is on, in, in Malaysia. Currently, we are only giving it to 18 to 59 year old based on the current available data. Uh, there has been some talk about giving it above 60, but again, we, you know, data is coming out as we go along and I'm sure uh, the guidelines will change accordingly. So this question is about you know, um, why give Sinovac to the elderly? Why is it given in, in phase two? We, we are not sure of that. We haven't heard, um, you know, for sure whether Sinovac will be used in, in phase two or not, um, whether they will or will not be used for those with comorbids. All, that, all we can say is at the moment, Sinovac is only for 18 to 59 and those uh, without any comorbidities. Uh, so we will have to wait for the proper announcements to come out 
uh, from Ministry of Health with regards to the indications for Sinovax and also what kind of vaccines will be given for phase two and eventually phase three. So I won't be taking any of those questions here. Um, I think there was one on someone with cancer, especially on chemotherapy, can they take the vaccine? Um, do you want to answer that, Richard? Or? Yep. Sure. Um, yeah, actually, in fact, uh, if I, you note the priority groups actually are those patients who have cancers uh, and uh, on active treatments, chemotherapy included. So definitely these patients on chemotherapy uh, who are having active treatments should actually be vaccinated. Now, the issue, though, is the timing of the vaccination, because what we know is that sometimes when you take chemotherapy, it may actually um, kind of uh, reduce your immune system and your immune response. And so if you are on chemotherapy and you have the vaccination soon uh, after you, you, you've had the chemotherapy, sometimes you may not actually get such a good immune response. So I think the recommendation actually by the uh, oncologist, so certainly if you are having cancer and you're having chemotherapy, you should get advice from your uh, primary doctor, who the oncologist or whoever's giving you the chemotherapy, and they will actually have to work out the timing. If uh, for some uh, patients, if, if they haven't actually started the chemotherapy yet, perhaps they can actually um, uh, uh, have the vaccination before they start the chemotherapy, if that is suitable. Uh, but sometimes you don't want to wait so long for the chemotherapy. So perhaps in that situation, you may have to actually have the, the, the vaccination after, after you've completed the chemotherapy. And I think the recommendation would be like three months after you've completed the chemotherapy, then to ensure that your immune system and you are fit enough to actually take it. But certainly, yes. I think there was another question also on uh, something like, uh, it can, do cancer patients, can you exclude them from, exempt them from uh, swabbing and isolation and stuff like that uh, if, if they have been vaccinated? For those, uh, I think that at this point in time, we, we can't really uh, say that there's no policy on that. But um, um, uh, what I would uh, just say is that, you know, I mentioned that one of the, the, the benefits of, of vaccination is something like uh, we, we, we hope that if enough people actually are vaccinated, maybe maybe there will come a point where those who are vaccinated um, may may actually um, have a little bit more freedom. But but definitely that's not 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 something that we can say for now. OK, all right. Okay, so I've been told that Sinovac has been approved for more than 60 years old and those with comorbids. Okay, so this has just been uh, approved by JKJAV. Um, yeah, I think Hairi uh, uh, our commentary came out uh, a, few, a few days ago to say that more than 60 is with comorbidity. So, all right, okay, so that's fine. But will we, yet, we are yet to see which vaccine will be given for phase two uh, specifically, all right? Um, okay, um, some, uh, the other questions are ba basically telling us about specific conditions, which I think, you know, we can't go through every single uh, clinical condition. Uh, there's one question on, which may not be related to this, but I think it's very important. Uh, someone who had an anaphylactic shock from first dose of Pfizer, is it still recommended for them to take the second dose? Uh, I think I can give this advice and say that the current recommendation is say, it says no. If you had a, an anaphylactic reaction to the first dose, you should not take the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and um, uh, I think, uh, can pregnant women four months take the vaccines? So the current recommendation uh, says that if you are above 13 weeks and below 33 weeks, um, so between 14 to 33 weeks, you can take uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, the Sinovac, I, may, I might say something wrong, <laughs> but for my health, Sinovac at the moment is not, uh, not recommended yet. Yeah, okay. Um, and also at the same time, you know, we do have a few more webinars coming up in, in, in the coming weeks. And one of them will be on allergies. One of them will be on pregnancy. So we'll probably have uh, more up-to-date uh, information about that. But currently, 13 to 33 weeks for the Pfizer vaccine. All right. Um, I think I will stop there because it started raining in, in PJ and my connection will probably die <laughs> if I don't go off now. Um, so before, before I end, um, I'd like to say thank you to both speakers for sparing their time to be on, on board here. 
Um, we did have a very interesting uh, session with the both of you and with everyone who attended. Thank you very much for coming on board. Uh, please do join us again uh, next week at the same time. Next week's topic is on side effects and concerns about vaccination. So those who had questions on side effects, those who are concerned about the, the various vaccines, this may be a good week to come on board and ask your questions. So the webinar on the 21st of April will focus on severe non-allergic side effects of vaccine, risk factors for severe side effects, patients that require pre-assessment prior to vaccination, and possible thrombotic complications after vaccine. So these, com these thrombotic complications is probably one of the biggest worries at the moment. So please tune in next week and uh, we will have the answers for you then. So thank you very much once again and hope to see all of you next week. Thanks, Riza and Richard. Most welcome. Bye.